I'm Dave Cocking and the main presenter today will be Nishesh Jain. In this webinar, Nishesh will introduce some significant changes to Design Builder's daylighting interface and new capabilities. He'll show you how to set up and run a range of daylighting calculations and then he'll review some results and he'll provide some guidance for daylight related compliance simulations. Design Builder uses the Radiance simulation engine to run daylighting simulations. These are run from the same model you might have created for energy and thermal comfort analysis for design, compliance and building certification. So for those of you less familiar with Design Builder, what is it? It's a fully integrated, multidisciplinary graphical interface. Design Builder enables you to use the gold standard global simulation engines, including Energy Plus and Radiance, in faster, easier, and more productive ways. Design Builder is the most capable and mature third party interface to Energy Plus, which is our main energy and thermal comfort simulation engine. All these engines are fully integrated within Design Builder's high productivity interface. So all the analyses you see here can all be run seamlessly from a single model. Design Builder is different to the other mainstream simulation software. It makes modeling buildings and their systems from early design through detailed modeling stages, faster, easier, and more productive. You can seamlessly progress an early stage model and compliance model into a performance model without having to use another model or start again in different software. For those of you using Design Builder certification module for compliance, you can also easily switch back and forth between design and certification in the same model enabling you to simultaneously improve your design and compliance rating much more efficiently. Some commercial software enables you to do simpler modeling and simulation, and some enables you to do compliance or more sophisticated modeling. But as far as I know, Design Builder is still the only commercial software that enables you to do all this quickly and easily in the same interface using the same model. So you could think of Design Builder as your one-stop shop for simulation and compliance with all the capabilities you're likely to need in one efficient tool. Once you've built your geometric model, either by importing it from a BIM tool or via GBXML or IDF import, or by using Design Builder's industry-leading geometry tools, you can use that one model to assess energy, comfort, and environmental performance, model HVAC system performance in detail, run a variety of compliance and certification simulations, including for LEED, BRIAM, WELL, GreenStar, and several other national and regional codes and regulations. You can use the most advanced scripting capabilities of all the main simulation tools. That means you aren't constrained by fixed software algorithms. So for example, you can model and simulate the performance of novel or manufacturer specific equipment configurations and controls, not just pre and post processing, but runtime simulation of their impact on your building and systems at each time step in your simulations. Run parametric design optimization, uncertainty and sensitivity analyses to visualize and fully understand which model inputs have the biggest impact on the performance of your building. Run cost calculations, including life cycle cost, life cycle analysis and operational costs. New climate and weather tools, which were covered in detail in a couple of webinars last year. CFD, 
currently using Design Builder's own fast and simplified engine with an interface to the Open Foam engine for more advanced CFD applications, hopefully coming later this year pending development progress. And the focus of this webinar. Design Builder provides a wide range of the most important and commonly used daylighting metrics and calculations, including specific outputs for LEED, BRIAM and Green Star certification. And finally, our visualization tools that enable you to generate realistic rendered images of your building, including internal and external shading at any time of year. All these tools, except for climate analytics, are directly accessible from Design Builder's fully integrated interface. Having all the functionality you need for mainstream design and compliance in one high productivity interface simplifies your modeling and can save you a huge amount of time, hassle and stress. I'll now hand over to Nishesh, who will introduce you to Design Builder's latest daylight modeling capabilities. So over to you, Nishesh. Thanks, Dave, for the introduction and hello, everyone. In today's webinar, um, we'll start with uh, exploring the basics of daylight modeling and provide foundational understanding of various calculations used and metrics. And then we will look at setting up of the models, key inputs that affect daylight simulations. Once the model is set up, we will move to the daylighting user interface and look at calculation options. We will show how to undertake point in time and annual climate based daylight modeling. And finally, we'll cover daylighting for compliance for various certification schemes, looking at example lead calculations and workflows for other rating systems such as RIAM, well, right to light, etc. Daylighting simulations enable designers and assessors to check for good use of daylight and visual comfort in their buildings. There are four main types of daylighting calculations in Design Builder. Point in time illuminance calculations, where illumination levels are calculated for static sky conditions. Next is the annual climate based daylight modeling, also referred to as annual daylighting. Here, daylight simulations are run for a full year with realistic sun sky conditions and climate data that captures daily and seasonal dynamics of natural daylight. Next is right to light compliance. These are specialist calculations as per BS 8206 standard that check if new building developments meet planning requirements with regards to their impact on daylight availability in neighboring buildings. Finally, you can also do daylighting calculations integrated within Energy Plus simulations. These calculations are used to calculate savings in electrical lighting based on daylight availability. In this webinar, we will be covering the top three with the main focus being on the first two. Let's look at the various metrics for calculations. For point in time, illuminance daylighting, three key metrics are calculated. Illuminance, that is the absolute lighting levels achieved. Daylight factor, which is a percentage of outdoor light received inside. And uniformity, which typically is the ratio of minimum illuminance to average illuminance. With design builder summary grids, area weighted averages of daylight factors can also be calculated for annual daylighting three metrics are calculated spatial daylight autonomy assesses that for what percentage of occupied hours in a year minimum required lighting levels are achieved on the other hand annual sunlight exposure assesses if the space receives too much direct sunlight as that can cause visual discomfort Finally, useful daylight illumination, UDI, 
tracks the percentage of occupied time when daylight levels are within a specified range, neither too high nor too low. In a way, single UDI metric can summarize the overall daylight performance of a space. Within Design Builder, daylighting calculations use accurate physics-based radiance simulation engine, which is one of the most widely respected daylighting engines in use today. You can generate high quality contour plots to illustrate daylight within each zone or block or the whole building. Also, summary daylight performance data can be seen in tabular reports. Using the map and grid outputs, you can calculate daylight credits for various certification schemes. And specifically, you can generate formatted reports for LEED, RIAM, Green Star, and uh, amongst daylighting credits. The daylight module is fully integrated within the core design builder thermal simulation feature, so no extra data needs to be added following previous energy simulation or certification project work. Now let's look at the key model data related to daylighting. This slide summarizes the key factors in model data that affect daylight results. These include model geometry, surface and glazing properties, and shading and surrounding buildings. So let's discuss these each within the software. This is an example model I have created of an office building for demonstration in this webinar. From a daylight modeling perspective, let's look at the various model data inputs that should be considered. To ensure the accuracy of delighting results, first the building geometry needs to be modeled properly. All the architectural elements such as courtyards, light wells, atria and shading elements should be included. Here you can see the surrounding buildings, trees, and shading that are being modeled as per proposed design. After the geometry is complete, we can select or remove specific zones where daylight analysis is to be conducted. The activity tab has this checkbox include zone in radiance daylight calculations that controls the zones being modeled in daylighting. We can see that this is selected at the building level. However, often transition spaces such as corridors are not included in daylight calculations. So if I go to the corridor here, we can see that this zone is not being simulated. In larger models, a convenient way of changing the checkbox for many zones at once is to use the model data grid view tool. Next, let's just move to the materials. The surface properties of materials used as innermost and outermost layers of construction play a significant role in light reflection and distribution. Let's go to the construction tab and edit a wall. On the construction edit dialog, the material used in the innermost and outermost layers are important. Let's edit the innermost layer. Go to surface properties. The surface properties of the material here are used in the radiance delighting calculations. The settings of interest include material class, reflectance, etc. These properties often ignored must be set appropriately to reflect reality. This can be done by modifying these properties or by adding another material such as paint to get the correct surface finish. For example, the default reflectance of gypsum plaster 
in this construction has been in this material has been changed to 0.9 to represent a white smooth plaster finish so this covers the material finishes related inputs next is the ground plane that is the ground that surrounds the building reflectance of the ground plane plays a significant role in reflecting light into the building by default the ground is the xy plane at the z axis value of 0 you can also use ground component blocks and set their properties to modify varying ground reflectance and finishes however if no ground component block is used around the building then as in this case the ground reflectance settings defined on the site level are used here are the ground surface properties as one value is used it is important to enter a reasonable average to represent the various surfaces that will reflect light from the external ground the ground plane created here reflects light in a diffused manner the next item we will look at is glazing glazing properties are defined on the openings tab if i go and edit a class the glasses visible properties control the amount of daylight that enters depending on the definition method the properties that are used in daylighting change when material layers definition method is used then the visible properties of the individual plane panes will affect the transmission The properties here if I change the definition method to simple then the visible transmittance defined here will be used another very important glazing property is diffusion Diffusion value controls the extent to which transmitted light is scattered and they have a big impact on daylight distribution. When diffusing checkbox is unticked or when the value is set to zero, then the glazing is specular, whereas a fully diffused glazing system would have a value of one. So if I go to program help, scroll to the end. You can see here that there can be a significant difference between a non-diffusing glazing here and a fully diffused glazing here. You can also use intermittent values to have partially diffused glazing. The effect of window frames and dividers and reveals are also modeled in daylighting. They are set here. Frames and dividers are self explanatory. Reveals account for the way the glazing is set back from the outside and inside faces of the wall they are located in. To gain a clearer understanding of the window geometry being used in daylighting, you can see them on the visualize screen. You can see the frames and dividers that are modeled here along with the component blocks and the local shading louvers.
Now let's discuss the different types of shading that affect daylighting. There are three ways to apply shading in any model window shading, local shading, and by using component or assembly blocks. Let's start with discussing the shading that applies directly to windows. That is window shading, which includes blinds, and local shading, as seen here, which includes overhang side fins and louvers. They are also specified on the opening tab. Under the shading header, no window shading is applied at the building level. However, if I go to the southeast office wall, then I can see window shading has been selected. This means that blinds are added to the window. The main reason for having blinds on this window is because while the other windows on this facade are shaded by the surrounding building, these ones are not. The other settings that are related here work with energy plus modeling. They don't impact daylighting calculations. Daylighting, blind controls, etc., are separately set during the daylight calculations options. We will be discussing them later. Another type of shading is applied on the west facade. This is local shading. It details, its details are also set on the openings tab and their material properties should be correctly defined so that they absorb and reflect light as intended. Component blocks can also be used to define shading and surrounding blocks. They might also affect the total daylight component blocks seen in pink here, shade windows as well as the rest of the building. The material and the material properties of the component blocks should be defined appropriately to accurately absorb and reflect light. Additionally, the transmittance of component blocks can be changed to make them transparent or translucent. That might be useful when modeling changeable objects such as trees. When using component blocks, you can modify their properties on the construction tab. The main settings here are for energy plus simulations. However, you can change the material surface properties to impact daylight calculations. Here, semi-transparent transmission in daylighting can be modeled by changing the material class. Finally, assemblies can be used to define objects such as trees or even shading devices, as you can see here. Assembly library provided in Design Builder includes four types of trees. One of them is seen here. And assemblies, when added, can be scaled or stretched to meet the requirements of your model. This covers the setup of model prerequisites. We can now continue with undertaking the daylight simulations. So when you go to the daylighting screen in the latest version of Design Builder, the daylight screen has been updated and the calculation results for annual and point in time simulations are displayed on a single results tab. Now, depending on the type of project you're working on, you can choose the simulation type in the display options. Relevant options and results then will be displayed accordingly. We'll be going through these shortly, but first let's look at the setup of the calculations on the calculation options dialog.
Delighting calculations are controlled from here. In the calculation options, you can see that the dialog has simulation type list. Depending on the type selected, simulation options are updated. For example, in the general type of simulation, you have options to undertake annual and point in time calculations at the same time. If you were undertaking simulations for compliance, for example, for lead, BRIAM, etc., then relevant settings will be displayed. We'll be looking at these shortly, but let's start with general simulations. Among the main options here, first one is the detailed template. The quality and accuracy increases down the list. However, at a cost of simulation time, you should use the most detailed setting that you can afford to wait for. The fast setting is not intended for project output and should be avoided, especially if compliance modeling is being undertaken. This is because it tends to severely underestimate illuminance levels. The accuracy increases as the level of detail in the calculation increases, such as the number of light bounces, sky divisions, etc. So generally, up to and including accurate settings can be used. However, for most typical simulations, good setting is sufficient. The working plane height above the floor level at which the daylighting calculations are undertaken. The value depends on the type of simulation being done, especially if it is for compliance calculation. The program help has guidance on how to run calculations for different working plane heights for different zones at the same time. Grid size also impacts the simulation time and accuracy. The finer the overall grid, the more accurate the results would be and the longer will be the simulation time. To maintain a uniform grid across the working plane, set minimum grid size to the same value as maximum grid size. The ground plane extension is the ground extension that is farthest distance from the edge of the building up to which the ground will be modeled for calculating ground related reflected light. Having a large value here will also increase simulation times. Finally, margin is often used in compliance to avoid inclusion of potentially misleading illuminance data close to walls and windows. These are the general settings that affect both point in time and annual calculation across simulation types. The next headers control the analysis that is to be done and their settings. Let's start with the annual simulation options. The window shading option allows the window blinds to be applied and controlled. They are the ones which we added on the opening tab to the southeast window using the window shading option. There are three control settings here. No shading option, which doesn't apply any window shading for delighting simulation, even if it is selected in the opening tab. Then the fixed blind option will add blinds selected in their activated state that is closed but only if they are selected in the opening tab, as we have for the specific window we saw on the southeast facing facade. Dynamic blinds then are specially controlled blinds that use rules that are defined in the LM8312 standard. The LM8312 standard rules are designed to maximize delight availability while avoiding glare. When dynamic blind options is selected, blinds are added to the windows, regardless of whether they are selected in the openings model data tab. This dynamic shading is important because compliance requirements for lead, for example, mandate the use of LM8312 rules and dynamic shading when doing annual delighting calculations. We will discuss detailed settings for dynamic shading 
when we discuss lead daylighting. Another key option in annual simulation is the occupancy schedule. It can be overridden here. And if not, then occupancy schedule defined on the activity tab will be used. The last three headers define the thresholds for key annual daylighting metrics. The SDA threshold is the minimum level below which lighting levels are considered to be inadequate. In this case, 300 lux is the threshold that is set as the minimum lux level required for the simulation. ASE threshold is the maximum level above which daylight can lead to visual discomfort. And UDI thresholds are the upper and lower bounds within which daylight is considered useful. So when running simulations for compliance, these are often specified by the rating systems. And if you are doing your own specific cases, you can modify the values here. For point in time calculations, window shading, sky method, and sky models can be selected. The settings are straightforward. Window shading options for no shading and fixed blinds work in the same way as they do in the annual calculations. Similarly, there are multiple sky methods and sky models that can be used. Currently, standard sky with 10,000 lux zenith illuminance is being used. Program help explains others in detail and their combinations. These are the main calculation option settings. Once set, the model is ready to run. In the interest of time, I've already done the runs, so we can look at the results directly. This is the completed run. Let's look at the point in time results first. There are two report types available, map and grid. Map shows the graphical outputs and grid shows the building and zone level summary statistics. For the map results, we can choose the output to be daylight factor or illuminance. And also the source can be changed for the scale to user defined to plot a custom range. A great application of this is to identify compliant areas such as areas having a daylight factor of greater than 2%. So to achieve that, I can change the low value to two, high value to two, and then apply the scales. We have the dark patch, which is set to black, and the green patch is the place where you achieve the minimum lighting. This map now clearly shows the area that complies and the area that does not. Now let's move up, move on to the annual results. I'll change the scale back to the building. And then under report type, I can see there are three maps, SDA, ASE, and UDI, and the summary grids. Map controls are similar, so let's look at the grid. Here you can see annual daylight summary statistics. Using the thresholds defined here for SDA, ASE and UDI, percentage and absolute area that complies is calculated for each zone and populated in the columns. For example, let's look at SDA. In the calculation options, we defined that the SDA threshold is 300 lux, meaning that during that year, if the grid point achieves 300 lux at any hour, then for that hour, it is considered to pass. Now, the pass threshold here is set to 50%. That is the SDA percentage annual hours of 50. So for this uh, Northeast meeting room, if I want to interpret, then out of the 30 square meters of total area, 
20 square meters or just under 70 percent achieves the minimum lux levels of 300 lux for more than 50 percent of the occupied hours and the overall percentage value for the entire building that meets sda requirements is 87 percent we can also look at results at zone or block level going to the meeting room northeast um, i've changed the report type to sda map and we can also enable the values to display a value of the each grid cell and i can change the source to percentage annual hours let's now move to the next simulation type So after general, we have lead. When lead option is selected, then all the settings are preset to lead requirements. Such as the working plane height is set to 0 0.76 meters. We also get a drop down list to select the lead version. And there are check boxes to request option one or option two or both simulations depending on the selection relevant settings become available this slide summarizes the lead version 4.1 requirements option 1 which is annual simulation uses lm8312 rules for sda and ase calculations up to 3 points are awarded if at least 40% of area receives 300 lux for more than 50% of the time. Option two, on the other hand, is illuminance based and requires at least 55% of regularly occupied area to receive useful lighting levels between 300 and 3000 lux. For both options, minimum further settings are required in Design Builder. So lead option one, which is annual day lighting, uses LM8312. That means it also uses LM8312 standards rules for dynamic shading. The dynamic shading method has two options, standard and detailed. Detailed option could take a long time to run in large buildings with many internal windows so a second standard method with some simplifying assumptions speed ups the calculation the standard approach is recommended as it is fast and does not significantly impact the accuracy of sda results program help has a detailed technical note explaining the application of lm8312 and the dynamic shading options in design builder For option two, lead requires the use of Perez method for sky model and options to change settings for morning and afternoon conditions. All other lead setting requirements are as standard and wherever needed are automatically configured. So let's look at the results for lead daylighting. So these are the daylighting results for option one, annual daylighting. Four report types are available, SDA, ASE, grid, and report. The map results are similar as general things, and grid is also similar um, as we saw before. 
the main feature here is the pre-formatted credits calculation report the report highlights the credit requirements the settings used summary results and zone wise results we can see that because more than 75 percent of our area meets the sda thresholds full three points will be achieved with option one let's look at option two here for a point in time the map results show the daylight factors or illuminance and grid has various summary statistics such as average daylight factors and uniformity ratios you can also look at option to report um, and here we can see only two points are achieved because 75 percent of area meets the daylight requirements so for this project uh, we should go for option one route for lead certification to get higher number of points so that's that covers the lead uh, daylighting and uh, let's move on to the next simulation type i'll now change the simulation type to briam in briam we can change uh, the settings and get results for 4a and 4b output options like lead most of the settings are changed to those required by the rating system such as the working plane height and the margin further settings for option 4b allow the modification for minimum and average illuminance thresholds for option 4a the sky settings can be customized i have run the calculations for briam as well so let's look at the results Calculated results in the reports show that the building is passing the 4A requirements and if needed, the pass threshold values can be changed for different space type targets. Similarly, for option 4B, the building passes the RIAM requirements. So next simulation uh, type we have is um, LM8312. This is an annual simulation based on LM8312 standard and its settings like we had for lead. However, we have editable options available to define the SDA and ASE thresholds. I've mentioned LM8312 standard a lot in this webinar, so let me just briefly cover what it is. LM8312 is an approved method by Illuminating Energy Engineering Society that describes how to undertake annual daylighting and SDA and ASE metrics to determine daylight performance. This method accounts for the movement of operable shading devices such as blinds and uses a lot uh, in climate-based daylight modeling for lead, well, etc. Design builders LM8312 results have the same graphical and grid outputs as you have for lead. Its general application allows you to even undertake compliance checks for rating systems which are not yet part of the current design builder simulation types. For example, for well, let's see how you can use LM8312 to calculate well compliance. 
these are the two criteria for um, in well uh, rating where lm 8312 rules can be used criteria l01 which is a precondition and then l06 which you can uh, comply with to get two points if more than 55 percent of area is within limits the first step for fell daylight modeling will be to prepare the model as we discussed earlier next you can change the calculation options change the simulation type to the standard lm 8312 and then set the sda threshold to 200 or 300 lux depending on the criteria being modeled and if the spaces are being simulated uh, are regularly occupied or common areas then run the simulations and when the simulation is complete then on the display options you can change the simulation type to lm 12 and report type to grade then the sda percentage annual hours can be changed to either 40 percent or 50 percent depending on the criteria being analyzed and if the spaces being simulated are regularly occupied or common spaces To look at the results, you can check the summary grids for zone and building level to check if the number of points are being achieved. In this case, the area that is in range is more than 75%. So therefore, the prerequisite uh, criteria L01 is met. And for the L06 criterion, two out of two points will be achieved. The another simulation type that is covered in Design Builder allows you to undertake right to light BS8206 calculations. Right to light refers to the right to receive sufficient light through windows. Light access becomes an issue when new development affects an adjoining property. Right to light also applies to obstructions caused by trees, hedges, etc. Design Builder can be used to assess the impact of neighboring buildings or other obstructions on the windows of an existing building. For this type, as per the requirements in the standard, four reports are available. Vertical sky component, annual probable sun hours, no skyline and average daylight factor. Vertical sky component is the measure of amount of sky visible from a given point on the outside face of the window. An unobstructed vertical surface will have a vertical sky component of 40% approximately and 27% is considered adequate for new residential developments. Annual probable sun hours is the percentage of direct sunlight hours on the outside face of the window divided by number of hours when the sky was clear with the sun. No skyline divides the areas of working plane which can receive light directly that is without any bounces from the sky from those that cannot. No more than 20% of the floor area should be behind the no skyline that is not having a view of the sky. In this case, um, only a few zones um, have little areas that have no view of the sky. The last right to light output is the average daylight factor. The average daylight factor is the area weighted average of illuminance on each cell. Grid results provide the average value for each zone. So before I end, let's summarize the various calculations you can do with Design Builder Daylighting. These are the key outputs and their reports which are available. So the general simulation setting option can give point in time and annual results covering all key metrics. Additionally, summary grid results can be generated. Using the methods 
and pre-configured settings, you can generate output for lead compliance. You can create maps, summary grids for point in time and annual results, along with pre-formatted reports for version 2 to version 4.1. Similarly, for BRIAM, you can generate results for both option 4A and 4B. LM8312 provides SDA and ASC outputs along with summary statistics. This route is used for well rating. So for well version 2 criterion L01 and criterion L06, calculations can be undertaken using Corrected settings and right thresholds. Green Star is another rating system that Design Builder covers. I did not discuss it explicitly, but its calculation process and outputs are similar to the others we have discussed. So you can generate standard results for point in time calculations along with a pre formatted report describing the number of credits achieved in Green Star rating. And finally, there is right to light, which generates results for all the four metrics. So this is all the key features and functionality that, that I wanted to show in this webinar. But before I finish, I'd like to show you the key design builder learning resources that are available to you. Program help, we've already looked at. And I can go to the website. And you can look at our past webinars. From the webinars page here. There are also free video tutorials to get you started. And we cover daylighting today, which is available here. There is also an exhaustive online on demand training content for various sections uh, available here, which provides you training material for a more structured design builder learning. Lastly, we have our case studies page, which also shows and compiles case studies using design builder for various applications. So that ends our presentation today. Um, thank you.